Welcome to lecture 3.4, the determinant of a linear map. Throughout this lecture, we will assume that x is an n-dimensional vector space. In the last two lectures, we learned about k-linear forms. And if all of the factors of the input are the same vector space, then we can define what it means for f to be symmetric, skew-symmetric, and alternating. Recall that f is symmetric if any permutation of the input entries gives the same output. It's skew symmetric if transposing any two inputs flips the sign of the output. And it's alternating if any time that we have two entries that are the same, the output is zero. And remember that alternating implies skew symmetric. And the converse holds, assuming that the characteristic of the field is not two. All of these are subspaces of the space of k linear forms of x. And it's worth asking, what are the dimensions of these subspaces? Now we talked about this a little bit. For example, this space, the full space, has dimension n to the k. And if you want to look at the space of symmetric bilinear forms, well, um, in the case when n and k are equal to 2, remember that a basis, or every, every such form, f of x, y, can be represented uniquely as c11 f11 x y plus c12 f12 x y plus c21 f21 x y plus c22 f22 x y. And it's worth exploring this because if if f is symmetric, then these two entries are going to have, or I should say, then then these two coefficients are going to have to be the same. And we can say similar things about being skew symmetric and alternating. And of course, it depends on both n and k. And there's some cases when the dimension is 0. For example, if, if n is bigger than k, so if let's take a k equals n plus 1, then there is no non-zero alternating n plus 1 form, because any set of n plus 1 vectors is always going to be linearly dependent. And remember that for any alternating form, if we have a linearly independent, a linearly dependent uh, set of inputs, then that will always be zero. So for this, the dimension, so in other words, the, the dimension of a subspace of alternating um, n plus one linear forms is zero. In the first part of this lecture, we will show that the subspace of alternating n linear forms is one-dimensional. And we can do this by verifying the following two properties. First of all, something we did in the previous lecture, that any two alternating n linear forms are linearly dependent. So if you have two things that are linearly de dependent, that means they are scalar multiples of each other. And in this lecture, we will construct explicitly a non-zero alternating and linear form. So that will show that the dimension of this space is at least one. And previously, we showed that the dimension of the space is at most one. The determinant of a linear map from Rn to Rn will be the unique alternating and linear form that is equal to one on the standard unit basis. Now there are several things wrong or insufficient with this definition. First, this is only for maps from Rn to Rn. What about general vector spaces? And secondly, we would like a definition that doesn't refer to the choice of basis at all. It should be basis free. It should be a property of the linear map. But that said, this is still how you should think about determinants of matrices. So it's like the sign volume normalized so the unit cube has volume one. We will prove that there is a non-zero alternating n linear form inductively. So we will fix n and we will induct on k until we get up to n. So the base case when k equals one is easy. Any non-zero linear scalar function, so something in the dual space, is clearly an alternating 
one linear form. So it's one linear, and it's alternating because uh, this is for any anytime you have two entries that are the same, the output is zero. Well, you trivially, vacuously never have two entries that are the same because you don't have two entries, and so it's vacuously true. Okay, next we will assume. So we will assume that f x1 up to xk is alternating non-zero and k-linear. And we will construct a function g from that that is alternating non-zero and k plus 1 linear. And I'm actually not going to do this in the full generality for an arbitrary k. I'm going to do it for a specific example, k equals 4. And I think it should be very clear how to generalize this by replacing 4 with k. But it's just easier, I think, to, to see it for k equals 4 than to see it for a general k. It's, it's easier to get your hands on it. Or at least it feels that way. Okay, so let's... Let's do an example. So this is not going to be a formal proof, but I encourage you to, as an exercise, to carry out the details for a general K. And I promise it's, it's really no different. So an example for K equals 4. So let's suppose that we have... So let's, so let's suppose that we are given F of X1, X2, X3, and X4. Then I'll show you how to define g. So g of x1, um, I'm going to say dot, dot, dot up to x5 is, so first of all, I'm going to do negative f of x1, x2, x3, x4. And then I'm going to, I'm going to add something to this. And actually, I should probably say a little bit more. Um, about how we're going to do this. So first of all, given this, we know this is not zero. So let's pick four vectors that give you a non-zero output. So, so given this, um, say that f of y1 up to y4 is non-zero. And, and I'm going to let y be the span of y1 up to y4. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a scalar function that's, that annihilates all of these guys. So let's write that. So, so let's, uh, well, actually, before I do that, so here, here's, here's kind of the picture we should have. Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. And then this, this is some wide, this is some four-dimensional space, so we can't visualize it. We'll think of it as like a two-dimensional space. And then, so let, let's find some Y5 that does not lie on there. So, so this is some Y5 that's not on the span. So I may add that. So let's take some Y5 that is not in Y. So let's find a scalar function that annihilates in the annihilator of y, so it kills everything in y, but it does not kill y5. So let, let me write that down. So, so uh, pick, pick L in the annihilator of y such that L of y5 is not equal to 0. Now, why can we do that? Well, and by assumption, these are linearly independent. Doesn't look like it, but again, this is a four-dimensional space. And so it, it spans, uh, it's a basis for y. And if we throw in y5, we get a basis for a larger space. So this is a linearly independent set of vectors. We can extend it to a basis of the entire space. And then we can take the dual basis. And then we could just take the, the dual basis vector of y5. So I'll call that like L5. So th there's definitely a vector that, there's definitely a, a co-vector that does this. Okay, so that's going to be important in how we define this. So I'm going to start with, with f. 
And then I'm going to come back here and I'm going to multiply by, by L of x5. And now I need this, because this is going to be alternating, I need this to be skew symmetric. So what I need to happen is if I swap, so, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to swap out x5 with every single one of these guys individually. So if I swap out x1 and x5, then what I'm going to get is f of x5, x2, x3, x4. And you know what? I, I should probably use red for this, x5. And then l, I'm going to put an x1 in here. I'm going to do that for all of the other variables. So plus f of x1, then I'm going to swap x5 into there and leave everything else the same. Except, of course, we need x, x2 to go out in here. And let's keep going with this. So f of x1, x2, now we got x5 coming in the third spot, x4, and l of, and in here goes x3, and then finally one more. So we have f of x1, x2, x3, and we swap in x5, and we get x5, and then we get l of x4. So this is going to be our definition for g. And what can we say about it? Well, first of all, it's clearly k-linear. If you fix any four of these inputs, then it's going to be linear in the last one. It's also non-zero. So why is that? So why is it non-zero? Well, notice that if we take these yi's up here and we plug those in, g of y1 up to y5, then l of y1 L of y2, L of y3, and L of y4 are all zero, so the only term that survives is this one. And we have negative f of y1 all the way up to y5, and um, L, sorry, L of sorry, y4, and then L of y5. And this is not going to be zero, and this is not going to be zero. And so therefore, it must be the case that, that this is, well, let's say, let's do it like this. This is not equal to zero. Okay, the, the next thing we have to prove, and I think the hardest one, is that this is indeed alternating. So why is this alternating? So we have to show that if we take two inputs from here and we make them the same, then we'll get zero. And there's really two cases we have to check. One of them is that we take two inputs that are these first four among the first four variables. And then we also have to check that we take one of these and we take x5. So let's let's do the first case. Um, so case so case one is that um, xi equals xj and i and j are less than five. So it doesn't really matter. By symmetry, you can see it, it doesn't matter which two I pick. So let's let's make things easier and let's let's say that x1 um, equals x2. So if that's the case, um, let's think about what happens. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna highlight in green here all, all of the x1s and the x2s. So, so x1, x2, x1. Here's x1 and x2, x1 and x2, x1 and x2, x1 and x2. So if these are equal, so if these are equal, then what, what can we say? Well, anytime that they both appear in f, um, f is going to be zero. So this is zero, this is zero, this is zero. And so the only two cases, you can see that this is going to hold not just for k equals four, but k equals hundred or anything, is that there's really only two cases that survive. And that's where, one of them is where x1 gets knocked out into L, this one here, so 
swapped out. And the other one is where x2 gets swapped out. And for g to be alternating, these things have to cancel each other out. They have to be negatives of each other. And let's see why that is. So again, x1 and x2, the green entries are the same. So the only two differences in the inputs of here and here is the fact that in the first one, x5 is in this first entry, and then the green entry is next. And here, the green entry is in the first, and x5 is in the next, the second. So these two, um, so again, L of x1 equals L of x2, because x1 and x2 are equal, and F of these inputs equals negative F of these inputs. Again, because all we are doing here is just swapping these two inputs. So here, um, indeed, we have f of x5, x2, x3, x4 equals negative f of x2, x5, x3, x4. And of course, this is equal to x1. So indeed, um, this is alternating. And then the last case we have to check is when um, x i is less than or i is less than five and j is is equal to five. So so we can say um, so without loss of generality, uh, let's say that x four equals. It's not quite loss of generality, but without loss of generality and up to symmetry that these, these are equal. So, so let's see what happens now if I make these um, x4 and x5 equal. So I'm gonna use a different color now. So let's, um, so let's say that x4 and x5 are the same up here. So I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna circle x4 and x5. So four and five, four and five, four and five, circling in blue. And again, once, once again, any time where we have where both of these appear in the inside, f is going to be zero. The whole term is zero, and these and these are going to appear in general. These are always going to appear in the inside, except for two terms, namely when when one of them gets swapped out here. Um, so so again, this is zero. This is zero. But when x five gets swapped out, well, l of x five is not well. L of x4 is equal to zero, and x5 is equal to x4. So this term is going to, so now I can write over this. So this term is going to be equal to zero because L of x4 equals x5 is zero. We've already said why, why these terms are, are zero. And finally, this last term is equal to zero for the same reason, L, uh, L of x4 equals zero. So in this case, G um, of y1 up to y5 is, is clearly equal to zero. Okay, so I, hopefully you can see how to generalize this for a, a general k. You know, just add some ellipses, some dot, dot, dots, and make this k and talk about um, the two cases um, like this. And that's why there is a non-zero alternating and linear form. And, and also it's worth thinking about how this fails. Because um, this is... Obviously, this thing is going to fail um, if we try to go up to n plus 1, because there is no n plus 1 alternating and linear form. So th this is not going to work indefinitely. So, so somewhere in here, we were assuming that 4 is, is less than n to, uh, to continue this. So I, I didn't say that explicitly, but it's, it's worth pausing this to make sure that you, you see where that subtlety was. Because again, what I have is, is a proof sketch rather than an actual rigorous proof. But I think the, all the basic ideas are here. Now we can finally get to how this relates to determinants. Let's let t, as before, be a linear function from x to itself. If we have any alternating n linear form f, I claim that t defines or induces a new alternating n linear form. And here's how it works. So we're, we're gonna call f the old one, and then t bar f is, is the and linear form that's induced by t. So it's from xn to k, and it's defined on x1 up to xn by applying the old function f to the image of each of the vectors t1 up to tn. 
This defines a linear map, sending f to t bar f. And it's a map on the one-dimensional space of alternating and linear forms. Now, a one-dimensional space is just a line. So it's isomorphic to k, the first. And any linear map from a one-dimensional space to itself is just a scalar. It takes any vector, v, and it scales it by lambda v. So that's what this t bar has to do. It has to take f, this function, and scale it by some lambda. And that scalar is called the determinant of t. Now here's how I like to think about this. So you have your standard unit basis, and we don't have to define this in terms of a basis, but it still helps, t1, t2, or e1, e2, and e3. And it's, it's still helpful to think about a determinant as signed volume, so because we secretly know that's what it is. So this is a, an alternating and linear form, which happens to be signed volume. And there might be many other alternating and linear forms. However, we just proved that all of them are signed volume up to scalars. So if this is E1, E2, E3, then, then uh, applying T sends this to a parallel pipe bed. Let me see if I can draw this. I'll probably fail miserably. So something like, something like this. I'll just leave it like that. Say, say this is TE1, TE2, and maybe this is TE3. So T sends this to this. And now we know that any alternating and linear form is a scalar multiple. So, um, or, or is a scalar multiple of, the, of this one. So if F of in this case, f of e1, e2, e3 is signed volume, then f of t e1, t e2, and t e3 is the signed volume of this thing. Now, don't take this as the definition. It certainly does not work over other fields where we don't have a nice notion of volume, but it, it's still a nice little mental picture that you should have. And now I want to show you another way to think about determinant. This is a more advanced um, idea called universal property. I'm not going to talk too much about this, but um, there's a lot of ideas, constructs in mathematics, everything from um, certain types of maps to certain types of objects like direct sums, direct products that can be defined or at least can be characterized um, in, in a sense like this, where given something, it is the unique object that satisfies some property, and there's often a commutative diagram approach. And I know that's about as vague as I can be, but it's really a huge topic that I, I cannot get into um, just like this. But it's worth seeing this because you, you will likely see other things like this, not just in this class, but in other classes. So um, the determinant satisfies the following. So given a linear map T from X to X, you can think of it like a square matrix. There exists a unique scalar, which is the determinant, such that for every alternating and linear form f, so no matter how you define sine volume, which we now know is up to is is just up to scalar. So no matter how you normalize it, f of the image of these vectors t1 up to tn is just a scalar times f of the original basis vectors. So in terms of a diagram, I know T goes from X to X, but if you're thinking about a matrix, you know, think, um, think about X1 up to X, and think about the columns of a matrix. That's gonna, uh, the columns together form X or X to the N. And you're applying T to each column. So um, T X1 up to T X N. So, so you can think of the map that sends the N columns here to the N columns here as, as uh, t to the n. And then f, if f is any alternating and linear form, we now know that there's it's basically sine volume of the normalization. So f is, is any alternating and linear form. 
we can apply that before to our input basis or our output basis. Actually, I don't want to say output basis because these, this doesn't have to be linearly independent. So we, we can apply it to our, our input basis and we can apply it to the image of that. And if we do that, both of these, we get numbers. And those numbers differ by a single scalar, which is only a property of the linear map and not of the actual vectors themselves. Okay, so take a moment to look at this, think about this, wrap your head around it. It's worth pausing this video. It's an important topic. And I'm not gonna prove this, I'm just gonna, I, but, but convince yourself why I basically um, already, we've, we've basically already done this. This is just a reformalization, a restatement of the things that we've already shown. We will finish this lecture with a few basic properties of determinants. If T is the linear map that just takes any input and scales it by T, so it might be a positive scalar or a fractional, so it might be like a compression or it might be negative, like a reflection, like Tx could be negative 3x, then that induces the following map on alternating and linear forms. So if, if F is any alternating and linear form, then T bar of F is a new alternating and linear form. And if you plug in X1 up to Xn, you get, again, by, by definition, F of Tx1 up to Txn, which we know is F of Cx1 up to Cxn. Now, since this is an n linear function, we can pull out all of the c's and get c to the n times f. So in other words, the determinant of t is c to the n. And that should make sense. If you have the unit square and you multiply everything by two, you will have doubled the area. If you take the unit cube and you multiply and you scale it by two, so that this is area equals one, this is area equals four, this is volume equals one, then you will get a box. I really can't draw this very well, sorry about that. The volume equals eight. And you can see how this happens in any number of dimensions. As a corollary, the determinant of the zero map is zero. Just take C equals zero. And the determinant of the identity function is one. Just take C equals one. Now let's show that the determinant is multiplicative. That is the determinant of AB is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. This is a very basic fact in any undergraduate linear algebra course. But why does it follow from our abstract definition up here? Okay, so let's, let's try. So we have A, goes from x to x. Of course, b goes from x to x. And actually, how about if I draw it like, like this? Um, so a, b means do b first and then do a. And so this, this thing up here is a, b. Okay, so a, b being a map, using this property up here, it induces, so a, b, applied a b bar applied to any and linear form f is by definition f of a b x1 all the way up to a b x n now we can put parentheses around the b x1 and the b x n and you know, we can go backwards here so we, we can go from here back with just a. So we can, we can pull a out. In other words, we can write this as a bar times f um, of bx1 bxn. And we know that this, of course, is equal to the determinant of a. That's, so this is determinant of a. Remember that this thing is just a constant time times f, so it's in, that's the constant. f of bx1 up to bxn, and now we can do the same thing with b. So we can, we can pull b out, and we can say that this is the determinant. I probably don't need to do as many of, 
of these steps, b f, b bar f of x1 up to xn, which is the determinant of a times the determinant of b, because now I can just put parentheses around there, times f of x1 up to xn. And maybe I, I could go, maybe I should have gone backwards from here. So this by, by definition, the, the determinant, I should say by definition slash the theorem, the determinant of a b um, times f of x1 up to xn. That, so that's what the determinant of a b is. And clearly um, that is equal to this. So I think I probably could have gone away with maybe not doing every single one of these steps, but I think it it helps to see. So use the definition. You can you can pull out that a b, or you can or you, um, or you can pull out a separately, and then pull out b. So again, up here, the determine and that that makes perfect sense. That the scaling factor of this composite map is the product of the scaling factors of b and the scaling factors of a. Our last result is a simple corollary of Prop 3.6, and it's a very well-known fact from any introductory linear algebra course as well. So if we have an invertible linear map from space to itself, then the determinant of its inverse is just the inverse of the determinant. So to do this, we basically just take Prop 3.6 and we let B be A inverse. And I should say that this also makes sense intuitively. Like if if a is um, scales everything by some factor lambda, then when we undo that, we are contracting by that same amount. So taking b to be equal to a inverse, um, it's one of the things where I'm not sure if I'm going to work left or right. So let me just start with the determinant of a times a inverse in the middle of the page, and this is the determinant of a times the determinant of A inverse. We know that this is the determinant of the identity map. This time I'm gonna call it I. I, I called it ID up here because I wasn't really thinking about matrices as much as just linear maps. And here I'm, I guess I'm suggesting that I'm thinking of them as matrices, but I could have just easily has, have used ID here. But we know that that is equal to one this up here. And also in this font, uh, capital I looks just like a one or, or it looks just like this. It, um, I think this is clear. So we have the determinant of A times some number equals one. That number better be the reciprocal of the determinant of A. So therefore the determinant of, of A inverse equals one over the determinant of A. And that's what we had to show. Okay. So in the next lecture, we will talk about the determinant of a matrix. So this, this lecture we saw how to do it basis free, but there's a lot of things we can do if we assume a basis using the language of matrices. Because remember matrices are this amazing computational tool and there's a lot of leverage that we can get that we don't really see if we just deal with the determinants of linear maps. So stay with us.